Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And so for the final episode of this season of Resonators for 2018, of which I at least thought to be a rewarding enough experience, then I'm gonna do it again coming next year. I want to do something a little special. I've covered the majority of the big hardcore punk releases from the early to mid 1980s, and I wanted to end things off with an act that might be a little bit more obscure, but just as much of worth of attention as a group that remains a cult favorite to this day. And more importantly, given that I am Canadian, I figured it would be in good taste to cover an act from my home country and also cause plenty of controversy up here too. So, all right, let's talk about Canadian hardcore punk in the 1980s, and there are two important things that need to be noted here. First off is, like the United States, Canadian hardcore was very regional, typically concentrated to one of the two big cities, Toronto and Vancouver, and it was the latter city that spawned some of the biggest acts of the time, with acts like the Skulls, the Subhumans, and most famously, DOA, the last of which is one of the first acts to ever call their sound hardcore. But we're not going to be talking about any of those. Nope. We're going to be talking about the second album from arguably one of the most controversial of these bands. Although, really, most of the first album is packaged into this due to a shift in record labels, but that's a different conversation. And also where we've got a second important thing to mention here with Canada obscenity laws. Yes, in the 1980s, Canada had obscenity laws against the creation and distribution of depictions of profane sexual acts and extreme violence. And even to this day, some of this does remain on the books, for better or worse, albeit not particularly enforceable in the age of the internet, but also a different conversation. And this band was provocative enough to actually spur major court cases in the late 1980s surrounding said laws with their music. But we need to talk about what laid the groundwork to get them as one of the most grand graphic hardcore punk bands not named G.G. Allen. Yep, folks, today we're going to be talking about the 1985 album Fetus of Fetus by the Dayglo Abortions, and this is Resonator. So let me start off by saying that I've been sitting on this review for really a while, honestly probably a little bit longer than I should have given now I'm now overlapping with year end list, because when it comes to Daglo abortions and fetus of fetus, it's not exactly a complicated conversation going through the album, especially when it comes to the musical quality. The hooks are certainly there, sure, and the writing's got the profane flair that's made the band an underground cult act for those people who are in the know, but at the same time, I would struggle to place them among my favorites in Resonators. They're not not Minutemen for me, they're not Rites of Spring, and for one, like Kill from the Heart by the Dicks, it's a bit of a slapdash recording. The mixing can feel kind of clumsy and inconsistent from song to song, especially in some of the bass lines and drums, and really some of the guitars can sound a little seedy at points, and that doesn't even get to our front man, who's got the manic intensity, but also the sense some of it might be more real than performative. And more to the point, when I sat down to go through this album at length, I could highlight how some of the politics might seem oddly scattered, the nihilism's a little focus. There are some low shots taken at Pierre Trudeau's wife and strangely none at Brian Mulroney which for a left-leaning act in Canada in the 80s kind of caught me off guard, especially given some of their later overall output and their hatred for Stephen Harper. An overall sense that the project just didn't quite come together as much as I was hoping. And furthermore, for my final episode of this season of Resonators, I did want to make some sort of statement behind hardcore punk of that time and what I had learned, and this album just didn't seem to want to be the focal point of that larger capstone analysis, and so I figured I'd go to the source. And you know what? Something happened, and just bear with me here. And I am here right now with... Murray. Murray. I'm just Murray. Murray Acton from the band Day Glow Abortions. You guys have been around for past 30 plus years. Well, close to 40 years coming up because you guys started in 79, right? 1980, I think, actually. That's how you say it. I think it was 1980. So 1980. Yeah, it definitely was, yeah. Now, the big point of the show here and what we're looking to talk about is your album that really broke you onto the scene, which was Fetus of Fetus, 85, 86? It came out first. Well, you see, Fetus of Fetus is actually Part, like out of it's compilations, yeah. yeah. All that sort of stuff. It was a, it was kind of an, a short, mm -hmm. e a long EP or whatever. They're out of the womb. Right. That makes up side one, and then side two was recorded in '84. Okay. It came out on Toxic Shock Records in the right. States first, actually. And, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, then got picked up by Fringe. Like, uh, fuck, it was maybe within a year. It was uh, Fringe took it up. And, okay. Yeah. 
And uh, I gotta ask you this, when coming out of, like, that was a lot of the burgeoning time for hardcore, and you guys actually had some support coming out from a pretty decent label coming out on the, on the West Coast, so did you expect the level of success that blew off of that? Well, it was, I mean, <laughs> to be really honest, no, no, I mean, we started as, started it was kind of a, a spoof parody of punk rock, really, right. is what, it's sort of the satire of punk rock is what Phoenix really is there. And yeah. God, we were not really popular with stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was, we got some, but we got a lot of press, mm -hmm. a lot of really bad press is what we got right away, so. It's better than Gigi Allen's press. Well, I mean, <laughs> Gigi Allen got some pretty, got a lot of press too. Yeah, I mean, true. No poop though, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, well, not, you know, not smearing <laughs> myself or anything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of sexy, I guess, but mm -hmm. only in Germany, really, you know? <laughs> I get that. So, in terms of the album itself, yep. like it was a compilation of the two of them, and you said it's more of a parody sort of thing, but I remember reading a couple of interviews that you put out saying that a lot of those, that you were trying to get across some pretty serious ideas along with it. There is, sort of, you know what I mean? And then, it's like, uh, I was pretty young then too, so that was like, I was not a very experienced songwriter in that. Yeah. I kind of got clunky with the lyrics a few times, mm -hmm. but tried to keep it simple and to the point and there's I mean it's it's a funny thing if you can if you can sort of like you can't preach to people and tell them shit that you know they don't want to listen to or threaten their belief system or anything absolutely they just shut you down uh -huh. they'll fight you for Christ's sake but you can fuck if you can sort of get people like all oh, like the way the tea it's like the way you, mm -hmm. you, the TV programs your mind like yeah. all relaxed uh -huh. And you feel pretty comfortable and yeah. you're in one of those accepting moods and they just start pouring fucking crap in your head. Of course. Well, it's the same thing as that. You just get people all relaxed, tell them a couple of jokes, you know? Yeah. Your friends are having like some groovy tunes uh -huh. going on, your friends yep. are all loving it. Mm -hmm. And then you just slip in a couple of little mind bombs or whatever like that. Because you went, you went pretty hard at Reagan at that time. You actually, And on that album, you took a shot to Trudeau, too, coming out of that era. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, it was a shot, it was whatever, it was just a... <laughs> Just kind of, uh, You're looking at a little moment in time or something like that. <laughs> okay. a, lot, a lot of people didn't get that really, especially in the States. They're like, what's this thing right there? <laughs> but you got the cover, but, yeah, that but that's the cult of Reagan in that time. So much of punk was a reaction to that. But Reagan was, Reagan was amazing for the punk scene. And he mm -hmm. really fired them up. I mean, he's yep. like, God, there hasn't been, it's really like now, I mean, God, these days, fucking warms my heart mm -hmm. to see finally like a, 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 a government in some country, namely America, yeah. do so much for punk rock as the fucking Trump government is doing right now <laughs> for punk rock. So it is, even the shitty bands are writing really awesome songs thanks to really Donald Trump and just Hillary of, Clinton and all Just because the, the DIY aesthetic and you just have a real enemy to fight. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's fucking hating Donald Trump, eh? I'm going, man, he's so awesome. I'll trade you Trudeau for Trump. <laughs> Trudeau's like not really super inspiring. He's been no. kind of and prick with it, and he's yeah. mildly embarrassing. And he really clothes up in front of the guy with brain cancer from fucking that band. He's like, yeah. okay, thank you for the support. And Trudeau's like totally getting in front of him and flashing his shit and stuff like this. It was, to it was totally was, posturing, too. Right. Well, no, I mean, now, I gotta, that's, that's low, though, hogging the cancer guy's fucking limelight shit like that, man. It's yeah. his last chance to even... <laughs> nah, that's unfortunate. So I, I have to ask you this. Like, in terms of... Like, I remember reading a few more interviews where you saying that when you got some protests coming out of that album, when you released Fetus Fetus, both from the left and the right. Oh, God. Because you, really? had some hard, you had some hardline feminist groups well, right who don't want right to issue the abortion There was stuff. issues with all of this stuff. Uh -huh. Everything like that, which is... I mean, I try, people go, look, you know, it's a fucking noun for Christ's sake. Yeah. I mean, you got most of your, like, university education, they're like at some university station, they go, so what does it mean, the day of abortions? <laughs> I'm like, uh, Jesus, it's a noun for fuck's sake. It's got no meaning. Yeah. It's just, the way it came about was funny. So, okay, then let, let, let's throw this. Do you think it's, imp like, going back to that album and how it's shaped for how influential it was in 80s hardcore, how seriously do you think people should take it? Oh, fuck it. I, I always thought we should put a little uh, thing on it saying, for entertainment purposes only. Oh <laughs> Misuse could cause serious injury and or death or something <laughs> like this, you know? I mean, just, I mean, fuck, I mean, mm. it's really, it's 
just fucking entertainment. Man. Just it's down to it, you know. Yeah. It's it's music, but music fuck music's got power. It's a language that has all kinds of shit in it, and it fires up all kinds mm-hmm. of thoughts, and it makes people think things. And why do make people think things that they why not? Would just like they're going, no, I can't ever think that thought. And I go, ha ha, I made you think that thought. Ha, ha, ha. You know? and it's like, so the fun thing, okay? Do you think you could have made? Do you think that album could be made in 2018 in the same way? Well, I was planning on making one way, way more shocking than that one. Because I, I heard your 2016 album. And uh, oh, yeah, I'm getting surprised. Yeah, yeah, you guys went into, like, you, I like the old track at the end where you took a nice, good broadside at Harper. That oh, was, well. That was massive. I guitar. attempted to put out a whole mm-hmm. Let's Kill Stephen Harper, I think it was going to be called album, but the okay. fucking record company checking out, eh? And, oh. And all kinds of wonderful ideas. I was going, <laughs> we need to drum up a bit of publicity around here. Yeah. I just proven method for doing it. It's called getting arrested for selling your, <laughs> selling your shit by threatening to kill Harper and continually on that. But do you think punk has that power to actually, like, do you, or do you think they would just brush you aside? Well, they, if they were smart, they would. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just can't resist, eh? Yeah. Like, just check this one out. I'm going to make this record. I've already got it green-lighted and everything. Yeah. Called uh, Hate Speech. Mm-hmm. Me the next day, or album. Okay. It's gonna have that painting on the front of it and stuff like that. Yeah. On one side, it's gonna be Donald Trump. You know those those uh, kids' books where you can slide the arm back and forth on yeah. the little thing. It's uh-huh. like Donald Trump fisting his daughter, and you can slide his arm in and out like this. Ti like, did something similar to that on yeah. one of his like music videos. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was his wife just basically doing a strip yeah. tease for him while he was oh, in the no, no, this is Fisting the fucking daughter that he's always running. He's always running. He's always running. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. So he's oh, just like. Mm-hmm. And then uh, on the other side, it's got Tony Podesta sticking a baby in Hillary Clinton's ass, and you can make that go in and out like that too. Eh? Like, yep, that'll do it. And then Hillary Clinton's like, like this with her fangs and some kid's kidney in her mm-hmm. hand or something like this. Yeah. Russian hookers pissing all over the lot of them and stuff like this. It works so, because that will that will draw contrast. Check this one. No, 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 it gets better. But you know, there's there's the baby being yeah. uh-huh. used in, in an obvious sex thing. I mean, mm-hmm. Try and make it as graphic and as realistic as yeah. possible. Uh-huh. Then it's got a black sheet that folds over it and says, "Okay, warning: This album contains extreme pornography involving children." <laughs> it might be illegal in some areas. Consult with local authorities before purchasing. Yeah, and that's what you get. You see, it's looking mm-hmm. there like that. Yeah. that's what you see. And you'd open it up, and sure enough, just like it guaranteed on the front cover, mm-hmm. there's a baby being stuffed up someone's <laughs> anus, and <laughs> poop all over its head, and stuff like this. Yep. And uh, which is technically, according to the obscenity laws in Canada, uh-huh. well, there was there was obs- the, no, there was the obscenity laws yeah. because of the court case we got involved in with fringing and right. uh, and all that. Mm-hmm. They had to rewrite that part of the Constitution, and <laughs> it's now called the Pornography Act, I believe. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's pornography very, that's made in Canada. Though. Very explicit that anything involving children mm-hmm. does not have to be video. It can be oh. fictitious written words. It can be it can be anything album art. <laughs> other than just about thoughts. Mm-hmm. Is is qualifies as child pornography and there's children in it, so ta da! <laughs> like this. And, uh, and oh. then we go, and then we go, you know, I just wanted to like, make a thing, and it's like, it's like fishing, man. Yeah. You're going to put the bait on the hook, and you see what happens. Out there, and, you know, sometimes they bite, and sometimes they don't. And you know, they, they bite, I might get some fucking put in jail for the rest of my life or some shit like this, who knows? It's, Mon- it's not threatening to kill the Prime Minister anymore, which oh. might have been a little much, that one, but... You never know. So, okay, and let's go go back to the 80s in terms of that scene. Do you think the scene nowadays in, like, the 2010s is better or worse than what it was in the 80s? Well, it's... it's There's more opportunity for bands to get paid, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, I mean, there's... At some levels, it might seem like there's not anything going on, and there's not a lot of bands, there's a lot of dead re- rehash shit and stuff like that. Yeah. But once you get out on the road and go from town to town to town, you realize that wow, there's fucking bands on there. There's shit that just blows your fucking mind. All over. like, mm. God, in Amsterdam, this there were about twenty of these kids. One of the first band to play. They caught okay. a fucking train from Rotterdam with their gear. All right. This brother and a sister. And, and this friend of theirs, mm. and they were like, the chick played guitar and sang, uh-huh. the 
her brother was the bass player and her friend was the drummer and they were fucking sick. Wow. They were just playing this crazy weird jazz shit kind of that. Yeah. This Bay Ray really she had like a, mm. a Jaguar and it was a big jangly with Echo. Mm. And just all of a sudden they kick into balls out of fucking hardcore, right? And the chick could wail. She really had some lungs. It was an awesome guitar, really aggressive guitar player. Nice. Like, holy shit. <laughs> us, us and the goalers stood there like Derek and fucking Walter from the goalers were just like, what the fuck, eh? This sort of tubby little innocuous fucking 20 year old girl and wearing a funny, she was wearing like this weird little skirt too, like a little dress with polka dots on it or something. And yeah, and she just totally like shred. tearing the shit out of the place, eh? And I was that's like, awesome. oh my god. Like, that's, that's really cool to hear. Um, I guess the one question I always like to ask about this sort of thing, if you go back to Fetus of Fetus, yeah. is there something about that album that you feel has been underappreciated the past couple of years? Something you love? Something that, that nobody ever points out? Yeah. How shitty we were on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, holy fuck, it's just like full of mistakes and you can hear like... But that's punk. <laughs> well, I mean, that, well, that's kind of the cool, one of the cool things about punk. Was, yeah that it got rid of the elitism and the fucking you had to be a, like a proven like, virtuosos to perform and all this shit. Yeah, you guys are Everybody can, and really, to deny people the access to create their own music and to create the things like that is a fucking crime, really, because the, the shit that goes on, you know, right? Fucking man. Sometimes the, the least skilled musicians can get up there and just and just fucking catch some piece of magic that you can't even figure out what the fuck it is. Yeah. But for some reason, it's super awesome, you know. And uh, you know, and quite often the virtuosos are pretty stale. Actually, when it really gets down, they're stiff. Like, There's nothing to it. Well, yeah, it's emotionless, technically. You know, machines could do it. That's all I rant about Meshuggah all the time. So I totally. All oh, that stuff. Yeah. I mean, there could be some hard in it. And a little bit of it. But uh, punk rock is fucking. I don't know what that was even the question. Was it? it was the fucking uh, something that you Silly uh, Diego's album. Something that's in there that's not recognized. Well, yeah. I don't know. It's, I swore a lot on it. Yes, you I did. I'm <laughs> proud of that. When, I mean, they had the blood when they showed it on the news. Uh -huh. They had all the titles blacked out on the back. I'm just fuck yeah. <laughs> so I can't even put the fucking titles of the songs on the fucking yeah. TV, I was just like, yeah. It's kind of funny, I was actually watching TV <laughs> earlier on CNN. That They're, wasn't common back then. Well, now, there's, like now there's swearing in Chirons right now. Oh, so I know, I know, I know. It's the, nuts. <laughs> got fucking people whipping their dick out on TV commercials. Oh, <laughs> uh, does this look well right now? Uh, like this. Oh, you just need, you just need a, like a urethra brushing. <laughs> When my husband gets an itchy dickle, I just <laughs> use this little scrub brush and some liquid plumber. And yep. just, <laughs> I know what, I don't watch TV actually. <laughs> I'm just assuming that's what's on these days, probably, I'm thinking. Well, that, honestly, that you gave me everything I was hoping to hear, like in terms of, in terms, so, okay. Going back to it one more, like in terms of Fetus Fetus itself, are you happy with that album, or would you re-record it at some point? Oh, fuck no. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, especially when I listen to, like, Out of the Womb side. Yeah. That was produced by Nick Jones, this guy from the band called The Pointed Sticks, and was their singer and big. Uh-huh. He, he had recording studio experience and uh -huh. shit like that. We yeah. had no fucking clue what we were doing. <laughs> So we went to the studio in Victoria, but we hired Nick Jones and another guy, Colin Griffiths. Yeah. He's a guitar player from like Wasted Lines and stuff like this. Killer, cool people anyway. Okay. They came over and helped us produce it. Uh-huh. They were really into that kind of stiff records, English fucking pop punk kind of sound. Yeah. So it's really got that on that album. Right? Uh -huh. and it's, it fucking sounds pretty good. I, I, like, I was good, I go, wow, that's just super awesome and yeah. authentic right to the time and everything. I'm pretty goddamn happy with the way it sounds. I sound like a fucking, <laughs> I don't know, fucking kid and shit like this. I get a kick out of it. That's the good. other side's a little bit heavier, you know, but uh, you need that. same shit more or less, you know? And no, I think, I think it's all right. There's lots of flaws in it. But that's because of a lot of things. One of them was is we were really wasted. We were super drunk. Uh -huh. like, there's like Bible thumpers ran the studio. They had all those pop shop pop in the fridge. We go, yep. okay, well, pops out of the fridge. Bunch of beer goes in and we sat, we're drinking beer and shit. And they run, 
You know, usually bands come in here very organized and, you know, start like just nailing the shit off. You guys are like uh, just going to drink for a little while. Let's get the creative process going. We're getting, we're getting this going. Mm. But it, uh, it, yeah, I fucking knew. Uh, yeah, but that was probably one of the things. It took until, God, I was like, holy shit. It was the first time I recorded sober, mm. actually. And then the one with Blind Mark is a totally different yeah. kettle of fish because mm. Blind Mark is a machine. On drums, eh? so, yeah, and that's the thing you know, really notice on the newest one. Is, mm-hmm. Whoa, holy smokes, that's a fucking it's an aggressive, it's got some pop rock, to it, yeah. Punk rock drumming there, mm-hmm. so everything sounds tighter, and yeah, you're like that. Mm-hmm. That's why that album's the, the way it is, is because right. it's blind mark. <laughs> yeah, someone Jesus you know. boathead, <laughs> blind mark. You know, I mean, fuck, although he's fucking. Lazy blind motherfucker won't even carry his own gear and shit like this. And it's like, once he's getting his vision back, eh, he's getting mm. an enzyme um, oh. injected in his eyes in a stem cell research program down in the States. Okay. That's why we've had another drummer on two with us in the same Makes sense, yeah. Because he's got to you know, do another run at it. But uh, we told him once he gets his vision back, you know, we can't call him Lark anymore. So his new nickname is Brody. That makes sense. I get you. He's going to carry my gear for the rest of his fucking miserable <laughs> life. <I'll tell> you. <laughs> well, you know what, man? Thanks a lot for this. Cheers. I really no, appreciate what's it. What's your name? Mark. Mark. Cheers, Mark. Uh, the, um, what the plan is to have everything come up on the end of the de- middle of December. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm going to have the finale. And yeah. cut in with my review of the album sure. as well, just in terms of how I think things hold up. And I still like it. Like, for sure. Cool. Yeah, and you let you let shed some light on some stuff. I appreciate. Oh, thanks. Thanks. No worries, man. Yeah, it's fine. I love doing this show. And thanks for letting, thanks for letting me do this. I really do. Hey. Yeah. No worries. No yeah. worries. <laughs> and you know what? There you have it. I'm not sure how much sense all or any of that even made, but to me it does provide something of a focal point here, in that for all of its rage and intensity, hardcore punk in the 1980s was kind of amorphous. It resisted an analysis. It was DIY. It was either composed in the throes of a lot of alcohol or drugs, or it was just stone sober walking away from them. It could be both optimistic or nihilistic or some blend of the two, but more than ever, it was young. It was brash, and it was willing to piss you off regardless of whether you sided with them or against them, what side of the political spectrum you were on. And being young at that time, often a lot younger than I am now, they couldn't give a rat's ass about what critics canonized then or now. They were just looking to capture moments of raw, unfiltered id until they could evolve into more artistically satisfying work. In other words, when I went back into the genre expecting a lack of refinement or the excuse of DIY would be used to dismiss proficiency or quality, what I found instead was a pile up of very real talent and passion that never needed the excuse and they never cared to make it either and while fetus of fetus is not one of my favorites to come out of the scene to be honest seven out of ten in my books mostly because as a fan of canadian history it can get pretty damn hilarious and provocative it did win me over but the goal of resonators for me was to introduce a genre in which i don't have the most knowledge and then give me an understanding of how it worked for good or for ill and hell When it kicks this much ass and spits in this many faces and starts this many fights and casts a long legacy that continues to this day where a cult act can go and perform and still get a roaring crowd filling up the room every single time, you get why hardcore punk like this stuck around. And honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way.